So if we really uh, spend some time thinking about the benefits of developing love and compassion and bodhicitta, then it makes us quite eager to cultivate those. If we don't think about the benefits, then maybe it seems like a bit of a drudgery. But when we really think about it in a deep way, cherishing others really is the source of all happiness. And thinking just about ourselves and harming others creates all suffering. So if we understand karma, then we really see how true that is, that when we harm others, then it's harming ourselves. And what is it that makes us harm others? Dig in our heels and be obstinate or be angry and strike out at them or talk behind their backs or whatever. What makes us do that is the self-centered mind, self-centered attitude that thinks that by harming others we'll be better off. But in fact, what happens is we create misery in this life because nobody wants to be around us. And we create a ton of negative karma that we'll experience the results of in many future lives. So we may think that we're protecting ourselves and getting what we want by being, you know, holding on to our resentment or our hurt feelings or whatever. But actually, it's uh, harming ourselves now and in the future. Whereas if we, you know, really take the time and put energy into cultivating a, a kind attitude towards others that wishes them well, that wants them to be free of happiness, uh, free of suffering and to have happiness, yeah, if we go around all day with that kind of thought in our mind, we're quite cheerful and happy. Yeah, we get along well with the people around us. And because we want them to be happy and not suffer, we do many virtuous actions to make that happen. And of course, because karma and its effects is in uh, infallible law, then we will experience the good results of that. And depending on our motivation, the results may be a, a good rebirth or liberation or full awakening. So there's never any harm that comes from benefiting others. And there's never really any good that comes from being self-centered and insisting on our way and pushing ourselves on everybody else. So spend some time in your meditation and retreat thinking about that. So you develop the, you know, the wish, the eagerness to develop love and compassion for all living beings. And then from there, generate the aspiration to become fully awakened so you can repay their kindness and benefit them most effectively. So may that also be your motivation for sharing the Dharma this evening. It's quite important for us to think about that so that it really uh, gets down deep and we, uh, and we want to develop love and compassion for others because we really see that, you know, when our self-centered mind uh, takes over, it runs 
havoc over everything. So it's very good to, um, you know, spend some time, especially since this is purification, and, you know, doing a bit of a re life, life or review and examine. There's a couple ways to go about it. One way is to look at the situations in which you remember being very unhappy and see how the self-centered mind was involved in that unhappiness. Now, sometimes, if it was you were in a horrible situation, then you could say, well, I'm unhappy because this person did this and this person did that. Yeah, and that's what we tend to do. You know, I'm unhappy because the things that happened to me, what these people did to me. But try shifting it a little bit and thinking, you know, I'm unhappy because I got stuck in being angry about what somebody did to me. Yeah. I was unhappy and got stuck because I held on to a grudge or because, you know, I wanted an apology and it wasn't coming or whatever it is. But, you know, dig a little bit deeper and see how the self-centered mind is always in there somehow saying that it's protecting us but it's not yeah because why do we hang on to the anger from you know past bad experiences yeah. why did the anger happen to start with we don't get that upset when the same thing happens to somebody else. Why do we get that upset when it happens to us? You, know, you can see the role of the, the self-centeredness and how it really makes us quite miserable in our life. And then it makes us do things, you know, because it makes us miserable, then it makes us do things where we think we're going to get rid of our misery by harming somebody else. Which is exactly what the person who harmed us thought was going to happen to them. They thought by harming us, they would be free of their misery. And now we're hurt, we're angry. Yeah, we want to be free of our misery. So there's the idea, if I bite back and get even, or take it out on somebody else who reminds me of that person, then I'll be free of my suffering. So we're adopting the same kind of tactic as the person who harmed us, and we begin to see it doesn't work. Yeah. You hurt somebody else, and then you go, okay, <laughs> you know, now what? what? How did that help me? Oh, well, maybe I felt powerful. I felt powerful because I could hurt them. Yeah, well, are you feeling good now? Or are you still hurting? Are you still angry inside? Huh? We just kind of look inside and we see, you know, that kind of behavior never alleviates our misery. And it just creates the cause for more. Whereas if we have an attitude that uh, sees the benefits of cherishing others you know, and we really put some energy into doing that, even though it's hard because we have, you know, from beginningless time a lot of habit energy into, <laughs> with cherishing ourselves and not much with cherishing others, unless, of course, they're nice to us. Um, but... <laughs> but only as long as they're nice to us. Uh, but, you know, it takes some energy and, it's, and we need a lot of mindfulness to catch it. And, you know, but slowly as we do, then we find, wow, you know, my mind is so much more settled now. Yeah, it, it's not like an emotional yo-yo. And, I'm, you know, I'm not blocked here and there. There's some kind of 
internal relaxation. Um, and you just think of, you know, how relaxed His Holiness is when He meets new people. You know, and how He welcomes everybody as a friend. Yeah? And so He just goes in wherever He is. It doesn't matter. People look different than Him. they are different races, different cultures, different religions, different political beliefs. His Holiness doesn't care, you know? He just goes in and he feels at home with all these people because his mind has an attitude that cherishes others, you know, instead of a mind that, that is, you know, well, I'm only comfortable when I'm with, you know, my group, yeah, my tribe, because everybody else doesn't really understand me. Now, that's not how his holiness lives. And you can see the delight he has in his life. So there's the living proof of it. It's not just something written in a scripture that we have to believe. You, you look. Okay. So let's keep that in mind. Also, um, I want to point out for the people who um, miss the Lama Chopa Puja. Whenever you, you don't attend, please make, you know, if you're sick or whatever, please make the point to dedicate the merit for all of the um, people who help us. You know, the people who donate money, who come and volunteer help, who do so many things for us. Because it's very important if we're accepting the offerings from people who give to the Abbey with faith, it's very important that we keep our part of the relationship, which is to dedicate for them and pray for them and, you know, whatever virtue we create to really dedicate it and um, for their happiness. So it's for all sentient beings but in the Bodhisattva vows, you know, there's one, um, that one precept where it talks about taking care of the people who are close to you, and that's what it refers to, you know, the people who help you visibly. It's uh, very important that we dedicate for them, you know, even if you're, you don't see them drop the food off, uh, you know, you know that the food came from somewhere. Yeah. And that especially now people drove up in the snow. Yeah, which is totally amazing. And everything else people send us, that's just, I mean, it's amazing how generous people are with us. So it's very important that we dedicate. So the Lama Chopa Puja is the time we do that. If you miss Lama Chopa, Make sure that you do a dedication on your own. We were talking about the different Buddhist canons, weren't we? And uh, how there's three Buddhist, extant Buddhist canons. Oops. The one in Pali, the one in, uh, in Chine Chinese, and the one in Tibetan. Okay. And so each of the canons has three baskets, the Vinaya basket, or the Vinaya Pitaka, Sutra basket, and Abhidharma basket, okay? So what each of them have the three baskets, but what's included in each of the three baskets, there's a lot of overlap and there's also some difference, okay? So I think we're on page 94, right, under the Vinaya basket? So the Chinese canon contains the Vinayas of the five early schools. I mentioned this last time, yeah? The Dharmaguptaka, which is the principal one they follow, the Mahis, Mah, Mahisasaka, the Mahasangika, a Shravastavada, and Mula Shravastavada. Okay. So it contains all five of those, and I think uh, recently um, the Pali canon may have been translated into Chinese. 
think there's something in here. It also contains Buddha Ghosh's commentary on the Vinaya, entirely pleasing, or Samanta Pasadika. Um, and the Tibetan canon contains uh, the Mula Srivastavada Vinaya, and the Pali canon has the Theravada Vinaya. Yeah. So two of the traditions have just their own Vinaya, and then Chinese, the Chinese canon has five of them. Yeah. And, and so, like I was saying last time, it really makes a difference for their attitude towards Vinaya. They're much more uh, a broader attitude. And if uh, the Dharma Guptaka doesn't explain a point fully, they go to one of the others and they find out and, and integrate it. Okay, then the Sutra Basket. Outside of India, sutras dealing with the Bodhisattva practices were mainly transmitted in the Chinese and Tibetan languages. The Chinese and Tibetan canons contain the Prajnaparamita sutras, the Ratnakuta, or the Heap of Jewels sutras. So the Prajnaparamita is like, there's so many different kinds of Prajnaparamita sutras. Yeah, it's not just one. And the, the Ratnakuta is a compilation of lots of other sutras. And the Avatamsaka, Avatamsaka, also a compilation of many different sutras. Yeah, okay, so the flower ornament or Avatamsaka sutra. That's the one um, where the, that the king of prayers comes from at the end. The, Mal, the Malakirti's instructions and many other Mahayana sutras. So those are some of the, the uh, Mahayana sutras that are shared in contra common, but many others are as well. Both canons have uh, Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle way, as well as many of his other texts. But what's interesting is the Chinese have this massive text attributed to, um, to Nagarjuna. I think it's called, it's his commentary in the Prussian Paramita. Um, and it's a huge text full of all sorts of stuff. And the Tibetans don't have it. And it's very interesting to me, like, why is that? Yeah, how did that happen? Because that text must have gone to China, um, you know, in the, you know, with all the other Mahayana texts. So, yeah, so I don't know. That one's puzzling. Because Buddhism was rooted in China several centuries because before it, um, res its resurgence in Tibet in the 11th century, which brought the translation of many later Indian texts into Tibetan, the Tibetan canon contains the works of Chandrakirti and later Madhyamikas, as well as Dignaga and Dharmakirti's works on logic, while the Chinese canon does not. Boy, that was a long sentence. <laughs> Who wrote this? Um, <laughs> okay. So, you know, because Buddhism went into China several centuries before it, it, you even have the first transmission into Tibet, and then it was destroyed in Tibet by King Lang Dharma, almost destroyed, and then resuscitated and rejuvenated uh, by Atisha, but... Atisha came, what, 11th century, yeah? So, uh, you know, depending on what was popular in India and widespread in India, that's what went to China and, and went to Tibet. So, uh, you know, and also according to the culture, like I was saying last time, in China the whole idea of debating and logic and, you know, proving something to somebody, um, that didn't go with Confucian culture. It was, it's not very polite. And so Dignaga and Dharmakirti's works didn't make it in. Also because uh, uh, Dharmakirti was later, like Chandrakirti, they were both, uh, I think, 600 to, you know, middle of the seventh, middle or end of the seventh century. Also interesting, um, Chandrakirti was a nobody in his own time. 
you know, he's so incredibly um, famous in Tibet and well-respected in Tibet, but in India at his time, he's not quoted in any other texts, he's not mentioned. People thought he was just too radical, he was too extreme. Isn't that interesting? And when Atisha first came to Tibet, he didn't uh, bring, uh, Ch well, Chandakirti's teachings still weren't translated into Tibet. You know, they were teaching Baba Viveka. <sighs> you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there, there's a big change happened in there between the later Indian uh, scholars in like the 9th and 10th century, and then the early Tibetan scholars who really started uh, to emphasize Chandrakirti a lot. But at his own time in the 7th century, nothing. So you never know when you're going to be famous. No, some of these, uh, the early Tibetans, some of them started to bring him forward. And then, of course, Che Rinpoche, you know, did a lot. But it started before Che Rinpoche. Okay, so the Chinese canon doesn't have those kind of works. However, many of those texts were translated from Tibetan into Chinese in the 20th century, century by the great Chinese translator Fa Sun, who also translated many of Tsongkhapa's works. So he was among that group of young Chinese who were sent to study in Lhasa in the 30s and then came back. And I just, he, I admire Venerable Fudson tremendously for what he did. Both canons contain works from the Chitamatra and Majamaka perspectives. Although in general the Chinese follow different Chita Madran and Ma, uh, Madhyamaka commentaries than the Tibetans do. Yeah, which is quite interesting, you know, because if you ask the Chinese, you know, explain Chita Madra, and then you ask the Tibetans, explain Chita Madra, it doesn't, not everything matches up because they rely on different commentaries. Also, the Chinese had a Chita Madra school, they also had a Madhyamaka school. But the Chitamadra school became much more popular than the Madhyamaka one. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Probably, um, well, because Madhyamaka is pretty radical. Yeah, it's, it's pretty radical. Although there were some very famous and important Chinese Madhyamakas. Huh? Uh, not as radical as the Madhyamaka is, yeah? Because Chita Madra is to say that there are certain things that truly exist. And for our ordinary mind, that brings comfort, yeah? Whereas Madhyamaka is across the board saying nothing truly exists. If you search for anything, you can't point out what it is. And that's pretty radical. Okay. Um, okay, Maitreya's Ornament of Clear Realization, Sabi Samaya Alankara, which is widely studied in the Tibetan community. The, the monks usually, and nuns usually spend at least five years studying that text. Um, okay, it's not found in the Chinese canon. Isn't that interesting? Why not? Something that, you know, they wrote 21 commentaries on it in India. Yeah, but it isn't in the Chinese canon. Now, was it written later than Maitreya's other works? Or did was it just that it wasn't in the pile of sutras that they picked up before they started walking? Or, you know, what happened that that sutra didn't make it? Or maybe it made it. And, and it's actually, it's not a sutra, it's a, it's a shastra. But the ornament of clear realizations, if you sit down to read it, it's not, 
it doesn't grab you. It's basically just lists and just a bunch of single words, and you really need commentaries to understand what in the world they're talking about. Well, I don't know. Okay. Um, what's the footnote on that? Number 28. Okay, the five works attributed to Maitreya in the Chinese canon are, okay, are the Yogacarya Bhuma, Bhumi, which the Tibetan canon attributes to a Sangha. Okay. The ornament of Mahayana Sutra is the Mahayana Sutra Alamkara. The middle beyond extremes, the Madhyamaka Vibhaga. Uh, okay, so th those are both attributed to Maitreya in the Tibetan. A commentary on the Diamond Sutra. And the Yoga Vibhaga, which is reputed to be lost. In the Tibetan canon, so those are the five works of my attributed to Maitreya in the in the Chinese canon. In the Tibetan canon, it's the um, ornament of Mahayana Sutras, the middle beyond the extremes. Okay, um, okay. So those two are in common. The distinction between phenomena and their nature, the ornament of clear realizations, and sublime continuum. Okay, or which is uh, the Sanskrit name is Uttara Tantra or Ratnagotra Vibhaga. Yeah, the Chinese usually call it Ratnagotra Vibhaga, and the Tibetans usually call it Uttara Tantra, but it's the same text. Um, you no, know, I didn't hear it either in the Chinese. Yeah, and. Um, What's, but what's interesting is the Chinese are very interested into the Tathagatagarbha sutras and the Tathagatagarbha philosophy. And that, of course, is what Gyulama, or Uttara Tantra, is about. So I don't know, you know, maybe Fatsun translated it or, uh, or the ideas came in. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this is so interesting how different traditions get different different things. And also what's interesting about Gulama is there was only one Indian commentary, and that was written by a Sangha. And it's such an important text in the Tibetan tradition. Only one Indian commentary. That's weird. Yeah? Why is that? So if the... Yoga Vibhaga is reputed to be lost. Does that mean it's not in the Chinese canon? It's listed as the one of the five? Yeah, well, it says that it's it's one of the five they accredit, you know, they attribute, um, but maybe it's lost. So, I mean, sutras get lost, don't they? Yeah. So I don't know how it got lost or when it got lost or... I mean, when the Tibetans left Tibet, you know, they couldn't take everything with them. So I don't, I'm sure some things got lost there. You know, of course, by that time, uh, the canon was set and it was, you know, there were, you had the printing, well, not the printing press in Tibet, but you had many copies of the canon that you could try and get out. But, um, you know, in ancient times, I mean, because all those 18 schools, remember, they all had texts, and we don't have them now. So I, I don't know. So then they're, they're saying that the, the Yoga Vibhaga was in the Chinese canon, and now it's not? Yeah, I guess so. Something like that. Yeah. Or they say it's in the canon, but they don't know. They don't have the text now. So who knows how it got lost. Okay, and then uh, the footnote, the last two works, so the Ornament of Clear Realization is in Sublime Continuum, appeared in India a few centuries after the death of the Sangha. Okay, so they came later, so that's probably why they didn't get into, um, into China. And Xuanzang never mentioned them in his collections of Indian Yogacarya texts, nor did he attribute them to either Maitreya or Hasanga. 
So the, the Chinese say Uttara Tantra Shastra was authored by uh, Saramati or Stiramati. Hmm. So they, I guess they know about the, the text, but attribute it to somebody else. Not me. Yeah, we want things to be nice and, you know, organized, don't we? And no puzzles, but we should know by now that history is very messy and very subjective. And uh, you can argue a lot about it <laughs> if you want to spend your time that way. Okay. Oh, so, uh, what, okay, so Fatsun did translate. Uh, Abhisamaya Alankara in the 20th century into Chinese, from Tibetan into Chinese. Based on the Chinese canon, I, I wonder how many uh, he translated it. I wonder if, if anybody studies it now. We should ask when we go. <laughs> Are you keeping a list? <laughs> uh, based on the Chinese canon, the Buddha Dharma spread to Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. Relying on the Tibetan canon, Buddhism developed in Mongolia. Four areas in Russia, Tuva, Aginski, Buryatia, and Kalmykia, and in the Himalaya regions. A lot of people don't know that there are Buddhist communities in Russia, and there have been for centuries. Yeah, many people don't know that. And um, Dorjiev, um, who was a... a he was Buryatian, wasn't he? I think, yeah, I think he was Buryatian. And he, uh, or maybe he was Mongolian. Anyway, he studied in Lhasa during the time of the fifth Dalai Lama. And so he was very, Dorjiev, huh? Oh, uh, 13th. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he wasn't that old during the 13th Dalai Lama. And, um, and you know, that was when Russia and China and Britain were all hovering around Central Asia trying to get, gain influence. And he, you know, was talking to the Tsar and trying to connect the Tsar and the Dalai Lama and things like this. Anyway, he had a temple built in um, St. Petersburg, yeah, which I went to. And, uh, and now, it, that was many years ago. I'd like to go again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that was more than a hint. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it would be good to go to St. Peter's Bank and we could talk about all the things Peter the Great did that weren't so great. <laughs> he did some very great things, but he was also kind of monstrous sometimes. And he was six feet eight. And in part of his life, he went to Europe, I think with some Germans, because he was very eager to modernize Russia, so he went to Europe to learn about what they were doing, and he wanted to go incognito, you know. But when you're <laughs> six eight, that's a little bit difficult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, today, the Chinese and Tibetan languages are the richest living languages that transmit all the practices and teachings of the Bodhisattva vehicle. Yeah, you don't have those sutras in the, in the Pali, um, Pali canon. Okay, then the Abhidharma basket. Now here, you really, you know, kind of, you know, because we hear the three baskets, they're all the Buddha's words, right? Yeah, that's what you hear? Okay, get ready. Um, <laughs> the Pali, Chinese, and Tibetan canons, this is so interesting, 
have different perspectives on the origin of the Abhidharma Pitaka and the text contained in it. That is an understatement. According to one Theravada account, the Buddha spent a rainy season, about three months, teaching six of the seven Abhidharma works in the celestial realm of the 33. So that's one of the god realms. It's the, the lowest one is the four guardians, and then 33 is the one above that. Okay. Um, to, so he was teaching six of the seven Abhidharma works to thousands of devas, including his mother Maya, who had passed away a week after his birth. Okay, so he was repaying the kindness of his mother. So each day the Buddha would go back at, at the end of the day after he taught his mother and all the devas, he would go back to the human realm and repeat to his disciple Shariputra what he had taught in the celestial realm that day. Okay. Shariputra then organized the Abhidharma literature, which was recited at the first council and passed down orally until the third council, which was called by King Ashoka around 250 BCE, uh, when it was included in what became the Pali Canon. So that's the, some Theravada's view on the Abhidharma. Okay? That it was spoken by the Buddha in the God realm. He came down every day, repeated it to Shariputra. Shariputra, you know, repeated it at the first council, and then it, you know, kind of became well, very well known in the in the third council. So, according to this traditional Theravada account, six of its seven Abhidharma texts are the Buddha's literal word. And the Buddha himself also outlined the points of contra controversy, uh, the Katavatu, which is the seventh text, which uh, Mogali Puttatissa would compose in a future century. So the Buddha spoke the first six, he outlined the points of the seven, and then Mogali Puttatissa, who lived at the time of Ashoka, he wrote that text that the Buddha had outlined, and that makes the seven Abhidhamma texts in the Pali Canon. Okay? Okay. Not all contemporary Theravadas agree that the Pali, Dhamma, uh, Pali Abhidhamma originated as described above. I think that's the, kind of the standard ancient story. Some say that the seven Abhidhamma works were spoken by Arhats, Others concur with academic scholars that they developed gradually over several centuries and were later incorporated into the Pali Canon. Most other schools see the, the Abhidhamma Patakas in their canons as the work of later generations of scholars. Isn't that interesting when we're heard when we hear the Buddhist canon, which is the words of the Buddha, and then most of the other schools see the Abhidhamma Pataka as the work of later scholars. Okay, so the Vibhasakas say that the Buddha spoke the Abhidharma in many places and it was later compiled by others. Okay, so the Vibhasakas have an idea that's more similar to the, the uh, Pali. Okay. Then, the seven Abhidhamma works in the Pali Canon, they have seven Abhidhamma works. The Tibetans have seven Abhidhamma works. You would think they would be the same. Wrong. They're totally different. Okay? The seven Abhidhamma works in the Pali Canon differ from the seven Abhidhamma texts propagated by the Savastavada school. Almost all of the seven Sarvastivada Abhidharma works are included in the Chinese canon, as are the Abhidharma treatise of Shariputra, okay, the Mahavibhasa, and other early Abhidharma texts, including those by Sangabhadra and the Path of Freedom or the Vimutimaga. So let's uh, talk a little bit about this. Okay, seven. Uh, Shravastavada Abhidharma works are included in the 
uh, in the Chinese canon. Okay, so that footnote is listing what those seven are. We, you can read that on your own. Okay, um, the, the Abhidharma treatise of Shariputra is one of the oldest Abhidharma texts now extant only in Chinese. These, there are varying opinions regarding which of the 18 schools it is from. But that's a very old one. Then the Mahavibhasa. That's a text that is an older text, but it's the one that was followed by the Vibhasakas. That's how you got the name Vibhasakas. It comes from Mahavibhasa. Okay. But the Mahavibhasa was not translated into Tibetan until the 20th century, until quite recently. Okay, and I think His Holiness got a, a copy of that. Yeah, so the Hoi Vasaka school was named after a text that wasn't in the Tibetan canon, that was a later text. And like I said, the Tibetans see the Vibhasakas as kind of the general, uh, the big heading over the 18 schools, but both the Theravadas and the Chinese say the Vibhasakas, they're not even listed as one of the 18. Nobody knows anything about them, you know, except the Tibetans. And the other traditions, you know, they don't know it. They never heard of the uh, Vyvasikas. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah? So it, it just shows you don't make what you learn too solid because not everybody believes it. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so um, what's number 29? While the Tibetans are aware of the seven uh, Sarvastivada Abhidharma works, which you would think, that, you know, the ones that are in the Chinese tradition, and the Tibetans, you know, they ha they, some of the things they hold are very similar to the Sarvastivada, and the Mula Sarvastivada is most other schools regarded as a, a branch, like a split off from the Shavastavada. Yeah, I'm not sure if the Tibetans do. They probably think of it as an entirely different thing, but the other people think that it's, you know, it's a split off, um, like some of the, uh, the Sarvastavadas in, in Mathura or in another area. You know, so they started, they were the Mula Shavastavadas. Okay, so what Tibetans are aware of the seven Shavastavada uh, Abhidharma works, they do not consider them to be the Buddha's word. Only part of one of the seven is included in the Kangyur section of the Tibetan, Kengyur section of the Tibetan canon. So not even the Kangyur. Okay, the Tengyur is the commentary section of the Tibetan canon, and only one part of the, of the seven is in it. So I remember asking, well, what are the Tibetans, where are their Abhidharma texts in the, in the canon, you know? If you don't have these and you don't have those, what do you have? So what they told me was passages belonging to the Abhidharma basket are interspersed in other sutras in the Kangyur section of the Tibetan canon. The two main Abhidharma texts studied by the Tibetans are the Treasury of Knowledge by Vasubandhu, which summarizes the Mahavibhasa, and the Compendium of Knowledge, written by Asanga, his brother, older brother, who writes from the Chittamatra perspective. Okay, so Vasubandhu and Chittamadra are like 3rd, 4th century. Yeah, maybe 4th century. Way later. And those are the major Abhidharma texts. Yeah. So somehow the, the very, very early ones, maybe a little bit here and a little bit there in the Tibetan canon. Okay. Then the, the footnote here is interesting about them. Okay, so Tibetans consider a Sangha 
as being a Madhyamika, but explaining the Dharma according to the Chitta Mantra view for the benefit of people inclined to that view. So his compendium of knowledge, a Sangha, is written, was written from the Chitta Mantra view, even though he was a Madhyamaka. Okay. His brother, Vasubandhu, okay, held the Chitta Mantra view, but he wrote some texts according to the Vaibhasaka and Sutantrika tenets to benefit people who appreciated those views. And, he, and Vasubandhu supposedly, as the story goes, okay, so these were two, they're two half brothers actually. So Asanga was following the, the, the Bodhisattva vehicle and his brother was not. And his brother spoke, Vasubandhu spoke very, very badly about the Bodhisattva and the Mahayana. And then something happened, I don't know what, and he had an aha moment and decided that, that uh, the Mahayana was wonderful. So to purify the negative karma he had created from criticizing the Mahayana, he wrote the Abhidharma Kosha, the treasury of knowledge, which was written according to the Vibhasaka viewpoint. And his commentary uh, with a, a chapter on, according to the Satantrika viewpoint. But this was after he had become a, 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 a Mahayana practitioner. So don't ask me to explain it. I can't. <laughs> yeah? I mean, it, it's said that he did this because, you know, it, I guess it was skillful means to communicate these, these teachings with people who had that kind of disposition. But it's, it's funny, I mean, at least to our ears, that you would write a whole huge text according to a tenant system that wasn't your own. Yeah. But I guess if you're a bodhisattva, you do that. Yeah. Now, whether that, that uh, Vasubandhu is also the one who wrote the Chitta Mantra text and the Bodhisattva material is something that the uh, academics discuss. And so there's some people who say that there's uh, two or even three Vasubandhus in a similar way that, you know, uh, Nagarjuna, you know, the, the Tibetans say he lived 600 years and other people say, no, there were actually several Nagarjunas. Okay. So the, the history is, is difficult. Okay. But history is always difficult, you know, to ascertain what actually happened. I mean, like, what's going on now? What are they going to write about that? Yeah, in 50 years. You know, in 50 years, how are they going to look at the, at the Trump administration? We have no ideas. What? Yeah. But... <laughs> right. So how are historians... And of course, you know, historians, you're looking back at something you didn't live through, and as you pointed out, even if you lived through it, there's so many ways to, to explain it. And even when you are living through it, you don't know everything that's going on. Okay? The, the PBS series about Vietnam was shocking, for me anyway, when I was, because uh, it had many of the tapes of our presidents talking about when we were talking with their uh, national security advisors and so on about the Vietnam War. <laughs> you know, and they're deliberately lying to the American public. Many of them, you know. It's, it's really, you know, and this was before Trump. <laughs> and they were some of the good presidents, like JFK. Of course, JFK was having an affair with Marilyn Monroe, and we didn't know about that then either. Although maybe Jackie did, I don't know. But, um, you know, but it's just, I mean, do you see my point? It's like 
all these things are going on. We don't really know everything that's going on. And a lot of it comes out later. And then, of course, you know, you pick out the part that makes more sense to you or you decide what you want to believe and then you pick out the parts that justify that. And you write a history book. <sighs> yeah. No. The level of importance given to the Abhidharma differs among Theravada practitioners. In Sri Lanka and Myanmar, it is considered very important, whereas in Thailand, it is not emphasized as much. So one of my Theravada friends say that Thailand emphasizes the uh, Vinaya basket, Sri Lanka the Sutra basket, and uh, Burma the Abhidharma basket. Okay. Doesn't mean they don't practice the others, but a point of emphasis. Okay, then Tantra. Spoken by the Buddha when he assumed the form of Vajradhara, or a tantric deity, another tantric deity, tantras describe Vajrayana practice. The Tibetan canon contains the most comprehensive collection of Buddhist tantras and tantra commentaries by Indian adepts. While the Chinese canon contains some yoga tantras, such as the Vairochana Tantra and the Vajrapik Tantra, it does not have any highest yoga tantras. It seems that the tantric texts arrived in China during a period of social turmoil and were not included in the Chinese canon. Okay, and Maha, you know, highest class tantra, that's when the deities are in, in union, and that doesn't go well, doesn't sit well with Chinese culture, so that could be one reason why they don't have that. The Chinese canon contains the Sutra of Abhi, uh, Amitabha, and the Medicine Buddha Sutra, and scriptures about other bodhisattvas that have been widely read and practiced in the Chinese community for centuries. While these are considered sutras in China, in Tibet, the practices of these bodhisattvas are included in the Tantrayana. And so this footnote also. Um, interestingly, in the Tibetan canon, the Medicine Buddha Sutra is in the Tantric section of the Kangir, while the um, Sukhavati Vyuha Sutra is in the Sutra section. Um, but they're both considered uh, Kriya Tantra or Action Tantra for the, for the Tibetans. The various Buddhist traditions share many scriptures and practices in common. Oh, okay. Oh, right. From this, from this summary, of the three Buddhist canons, it is clear that no one canon contains everything the Buddha taught or all the great commentaries. Nevertheless, there is more than enough in each canon for us to study, contemplate, and meditate. The uh, teachings necessary to gain realizations are there in the three canons. A respected Thai Theravada master told me uh, with both Theravada and Mahayana, the Buddha's teachings are complete. And Mahayana is just a name. Theravada is just a name. When we see emptiness, there's nothing to cling to. That was Achananan. But his disciples, some of his disciples clung. The Western disciples clung to some things. There was, when I went there, well, that's another story. Um, the various Buddhist traditions share many scriptures and practices in common. Although each has its unique qualities, we should not think of them as separate and unrelated. All three canons contain the Buddhist teachings and must be respected as such. They all contain teachings to be practiced. So that is very important. You know, it's very important that we respect all the sutras in all of the canons, no matter whether they're in our particular, the canon we follow or not. Okay. The, that Thai master uh, at the 
the monastery I went to, he was very, very broad-minded. Yeah, but you could see some of the Western disciples had trouble being as broad-minded as he was. They were, yeah, hopefully they're growing into it. <laughs> Although one of his disciples, uh, he came to a retreat that I led at Cloud Mountain. Some yes. of him, yeah. And he uh, also come, he attends His Holiness's teachings, and he's taken several highest class tantra initiations. So when the Chinese practice uh, Amitabha and Medicine Buddha, do, uh -huh. they, do they think that they're doing tantra practice? Or no, they're doing sutra practice. Doing sutra practice. Yeah. Have you heard why the Buddha assumed the form of Vajradhara when he gave tantra teachings? Um. Probably so that he looked a little bit different to give people the idea that the tantric deities look different. Yeah, and also because if he was going to teach highest class tantra with deities in union, he's not going to be a monk appearing, you know, in that form. So that's my guess. Back to quite earlier, is did you ever hear anything about how they thought that Chanda Kirchi's writings survived? Well, I this, guess, you know, somebody copied them out over the centuries, so there were copies of the texts. Mm -hmm. But it seems like nobody really paid much attention to them. Maybe like, you know, we have many books in our library that nobody's read. <laughs> you know, so maybe something like that. I don't know. I oh, know, it's interesting. Okay, so philosophical systems. In the initial centuries after the Buddhist Parinirvana, the Abhidhamikas rose to prominence as they developed intricate taxonomies of phenomena and explored the relationships among phenomena. So if you read an Abhidharma text, you know, it's... Um, you know, it's like there's triads and dyads, and how does this list of things relate to that list of things, and how many moments of, sub-moments of one moment of mind are there, and how many of this, and how does that relate to this, and, um, you know, a very, very detailed, yeah? and very systematic because they were really trying to uh, analyze human experience and write it all out and, you know, spell it all out. So it, it's, it's not, um, it's, the Abhidharma is a text you have to study. It's not like thought training that you sit, sit down and read for inspiration. But Abhidharma is important because learning all those categories of phenomena when you're meditating, yeah, and you're searching for the I, you need to search everywhere. So you need to know all these different categories so that you can search in all these different types of phenomena and see if, you know, the I is one or separate from any of them. Okay, so this included uh, material, this is the Abhidharma. Um, this included material and cosmological phenomena, uh, but even more so the facets of the mind, such as afflicted mental states and the states of meditation and insight. Okay, so lots of different categories and different, different things. Their focus was on identifying the building blocks of sentient beings' experience, rather than on constructing cohesive interpretations of Buddhist doctrine. Yeah, so totally different kind of perspective. Philosophical systems came about in later centuries when questions arose about the topics that were not clarified in the, quiz, in the scriptures themselves, and sages began to explain the meaning of teachings that were not evident to most people. These commentators did not see their writings as new interpretations of the Buddha's teachings, but as in-depth explanations of what the Buddha actually meant. 
they saw themselves as clarifying in an expanded form what the Buddha had expressed in an abbreviated form. And so throughout Tibetan Buddhism, yeah, you got to be careful when you use the word interpretation. Okay? Because if you say Nagarjuna interpreted the Prajnaparamita Sutras, they'll say, no, he did not interpret them. The Buddha explained something very briefly, and Nagarjuna drew out the Buddha's meaning and spelled it out for sentient beings. Because if you interpret, it means it's subjective and your own ideas are there. Okay, so from the viewpoint of the tradition, none of the great pandits interpreted anything. They just drew out what they saw as already there. Okay. Now, of course, how you explain that different sages who are all respected drew out different points, the you know, reason is probably because they were it was a bodhisattva deed of uh, explaining different texts according to people with different dispositions and mentalities. Okay? But they don't like in the word interpret. You know? You have to be careful when you use it. Oh, and I also got in trouble. When you're studying something and you say, this doesn't make any sense. He said this and then he said this and it doesn't make any sense. No, you cannot say that. You say, I don't understand it. Yeah, it always makes sense. We don't understand it. Okay, so, you know, because Westerners, when we don't understand something, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, but here we have to own it and say, I don't understand it. So really having respect for the, uh, the lineage and the, the great sages is extremely important in the tradition. Yeah. And uh, so some people really rebel at that, especially in the West, you know, it's like, rah, 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 you know, how come we have to follow the standard thing that so-and-so said. But um, in the tradition, if you start going around and looking at, you know, what these, these very well-respected sages and practitioners wrote, and you start saying, no, that's wrong, and that's, that's wrong, and it's actually like this, then you're considered arrogant. You know, like you know better than the Buddha. You know better than the great sages. So when you, you know... Like we were talking yesterday, you know, when you're debating, you can put in all sorts of ideas and bring in all sorts of things. But it, you have to be able to substantiate it through scriptural citation, you know, if you're bringing in other views, and through reasoning. You can't just say, oh, this doesn't make any sense, and I think it's this. Yeah, the tradition's quite um, like that. And you can see why, you know, if there were these great thinkers in the past, yeah, and one way, who were we to come along and say, you know, they didn't know what they were talking about, or say the Buddha didn't know what he was talking about. On the other hand, there has to be enough wiggle room in the tradition so that people can write new texts, drawing out new points that hadn't been drawn out before. Okay. And so bringing in other angles on a certain topic or on a debate. So you have to have room for that to go on too. Otherwise the tradition just stagnates. Another factor, uh, bringing about different philosophical system, tenet systems, was the challenge presented by non-Buddhist logicians and scholars. Debate was a widespread Indian custom, and the loser was expected to convert to the winner's school. Oh, which, by the way, remember before we were talking about that? We were talking about uh, Aryadeva defeating somebody. So was it Maitrasita or was it Ashvagosha? 
So I looked it up. One explanation said Ashvagosha, the other one said Maitrasita. So Buddhist sages had to develop logical arguments to prove the validity of Buddhist doctrine and to deflect philosophical attacks by non-Buddhist scholars. The renowned Buddhist debaters were also great practitioners. Not all Buddhist practitioners were interested in this approach. Many preferred to study the sutras or practice meditation in hermitages. So, you know, people have different dispositions and attitudes and you know, so there's got to be uh, a multitude of ways of practicing. From the viewpoint of philosophy, Tibetans have categorized Buddhist tenets into four general systems. The first is the Vibhasaka, or follows, followers of the Mahavibhasa. Second, Sautantika, Sautantikas, followers of the Sutra. Yogacharya, or uh, Chittamadra, mind only. And Madhyamaka or middle way. Uh, of course, each of these schools has subdivisions. These four schools are mentioned in the Hivadra Tantra, indicating that all four schools existed in India before coming to Tibet. Each system has further subdivisions. Okay, note 36. There are divergent opinions among modern scholars regarding the tenet systems when and where they flourished, the details of their philosophical positions, and to what extent the tenets were systematized in India before arriving in Tibet. So, lots of different views and opinions about that. What else is new? <laughs> okay. From the viewpoint of philosophy, Tibetan, oh, we did that. Even though not all the Indian texts were translated into Tibetan, many were. Among these, we find texts presenting the philosophical views of all four tenet systems, texts presenting the paths of all three vehicles, and texts presenting the, pa the practices of Sutrayana and, and Tantrayana. Okay, so the Tibet has a wide variety of material. But I think the Chinese too. I think the, Chin the Chinese canon, I think it might be larger than the Tibetan. I'm not sure. But it's, it's also very, very extensive. About there being room for new text or new viewpoints to come into mm -hmm. I've heard Venable, um, Geshe Kelsang Wangno say many times mm -hmm. that, um, that in translating uh, the Pramanavartika into English, mm -hmm. and then she's relying on all these Geshis as her sort of advisors, that, that just the translation part of trying to bring it into mm -hmm. English has brought up points that they never talked about, never studied before. So it makes you wonder uh. when, the when the texts were translated into Tibetan, and they were mm -hmm. so careful about that, Yeah, how, you know, the richness that might have come up out of their exploring what was happening in those texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did that richness get recorded anywhere, like in a commentary, or did they just kind of choose what seemed to be, you know, the most prominent one? So in these three different canons, are there um, texts in each or any of them that don't get read much, why others do? Oh, yeah. So it's, they're like more focused, they have something, but they focus on something yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are made there are texts that are really prominent in each tra uh, tradition, and other ones that hardly, like the Sangata Sutra, that Lama Zopo, you know, started teaching widely and giving the the lung for, you know. I heard uh, that was because uh, Venerable Damsha Diana Finnegan had written her uh, doctoral uh, dissertation on it, and. I don't know why she chose that sutra. It probably says in the dissertation. But, uh, but anyway, I heard that when she took it to Geshe Zopa and had Geshe Zopa read the Tibetan of the Sangata Sutra, he said, this isn't in the Tibetan canon. Yeah, because he it didn't seem like the kind of... 
it's an interesting sutra if you've read it. It's kind of all over the place. And it's really difficult to track the exact story of what's going on and what's being said. And uh, so, I don't know, my imagination is, maybe that's why Geshe Sopa said that. <laughs> yeah, he, and he had never come across it before. <laughs> okay, um, should we just read the introduction? Here and then, yeah, because if we get into the three turns, that's a big topic. Okay. Uh, it's also about respecting the sages of the lineage. I mean, all of them were writing with a very good motivation, right? They're not like yeah. trying to get famous. Yeah. <laughs> they were trying to preserve the Dharma, often writing in situations where, like, oh, the Dharma has declined, or, you know, there's so many confusion, so much confusion, I need to write something to clarify views, and then yeah. other people criticize you. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Of course. I mean, that that's. What happens? Not everybody agrees on the same thing. And the thing that's nice about Buddhism is we say the tradition is richer because people criticize and because people debate. You know, we don't see that as a drawback of the tradition, but as something that's beneficial because when people come and say, okay, you wrote that in your text, you may have written it with a good motivation, but I don't think it's, you know, the correct... You didn't draw out the points of, of the sutra, you know, well enough and, or explain it clear enough, and it actually means this. And I think that kind of uh, discussion and debate among scholars is very good, you know, for the rest of us who come along as students, because then, okay, you learn what this one said, and you learn what that one said, and then it makes you think, you know, which one do you think has the, the best argument? Know, and that's the way you develop your own wisdom. Okay. So it's not a tradition where it's it's just, okay, they have it all, you know, spread out. You just go in, memorize what everybody else memorizes, and that's it. Yeah, it's not like that. It's, you know, they want it to be an, an evolving, uh, you know, something that, yeah, that's evolving and opening them up, but within boundaries. And with and those boundaries, like I said, you have to be able to say that there was a precedent in a sutra, and you have to substantiate it through reasoning. You can't just go in and say, you know, Buddha didn't teach rebirth uh, because I don't believe in it. <laughs> that's not going to work. Okay. So don't you think when, when you study, you, when you have these different viewpoints, it's very confusing. Yeah, but it does make you think. Yeah. And we're still trying to figure out where the foot is, <laughs> aren't we? Yeah, where is this foot when you're going? <laughs> As seen in the previous chapter, the Buddha provided a wide variety of teachings depending on the disposition and interests of various audiences. He taught human beings as well as celestial beings, spirits, and other life forms. Oh, let me come back to that point of different views, okay? And different masters saying different points. We really, it's quite important, you know, to keep a very open mind regarding this, that things are said according to the disposition, interest, and so forth of the listener. And you see that within the advice that different teachers give to their students. Achan Chah gave a very good example of that. He said, if there's a very narrow path and there's cliffs on both sides, if one student is walking along this side, and it's close to this cliff, you know, then the Buddha's, gonna, uh, the teacher is going to go, go left, go left. If the student, from this is my perspective, if the student's walking too close to this cliff, teacher says, go right, go right. So if you take that out of context, then 
the teacher is giving contradictory instructions. He's saying go left, he's saying go right. What in the world are you supposed to do? And this is what you see is the source of a lot of, how to say it politely, discussions at Dharma centers where everybody's saying, well, Lama said, that's the famous thing, you know, Lama said, well, no, he didn't. He, Lama said this. No, Lama said that. No, Lama said this, you know. And then everybody's attached to what Lama said, that they have the right version of it, without realizing that Lama said different things to different people because they needed to hear different things. Like the person, you know, if you're too close here, go left. If you're too close here, go right. Yeah, they weren't contradictory. Okay. But our mind, you know, we like one predictable, self-existent thing that we can put a box on that's never going to change. And this is what Lama said. And it's meant for all people in every situation, at all times, in every single universe. Okay. And then if we can see it like that, then we feel secure. Yeah, it's called being rigid. <laughs> and close-minded. This reminds me of when we were studying Dzogchen with Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I asked the question about when he was talking about how Highest Yoga Tantra is considered one of the seven stages of Dzogchen, mm -hmm. not the highest. And, and he and Jeffrey asked His Holiness, and I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing this, but he asked His Holiness, well, which one is the right one? Which is, and His Holiness basically said, well, it depends on your predisposition of the disciple. I yeah. that so hard. Yeah. yeah. They even say about the tantras, because different tantric texts talk about the structure of the, the subtle body differently. And His Holiness says people have different, you know, structures of their, their channels, winds, and drop. So it's kind of like a doctor saying, well, you know, everybody has a skeleton, but, you know, some people have a femur and some people don't. And some people have three femurs. And <laughs> you know, it, it all depends. But as long as you can walk and get where you're going, that's good enough. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's it, isn't it? And that's the beauty of the tradition. Okay, so we should avoid getting rigid and stuck about things. There are many ways to systematize these teachings that reveal how they form a cohesive whole and build on each other, leading us to an ever deeper understanding of the Dharma. One is according to the three capacities of practitioners, which will be discussed in Chapter 9. Another is the four tenet systems briefly mentioned in the previous chapter, which will be elaborated in a future volume. The three turnings of the Dharma wheel are yet another way. The first part of this chapter focuses on the three turnings of the Dharma wheel and then turns to the topic of the authenticity of the Mahayana Sutras. In the previous chapter, we examined this from an academic approach. Now we will look at it from the perspective of Buddhist practitioners. Okay, so we'll stop there. And then do the three turnings. Do they, they talk about the three turnings in the Chinese tradition? Yeah? Okay. I didn't know if that term was used. They don't speak about it in the Pali. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, truth. <laughs> it sounds like you're saying that truth is always um, relative to a context. Yeah. And I like how in Buddhism, um, you know, not lying or the truth has to be kind and it has to be useful. Mm -hmm. So it's not just this dry fact. Yeah. You know, it has to be something that a, a sentient being can use mm 
Mm -hmm. for a good reason. Right. Exactly. And then I was thinking, um, do Buddhists believe there is an objective truth if there's no objective, or Madhyamakas, I guess? Yeah, no, there's nothing out there that you could say everybody sees in exactly yeah, so the same a, way. It's a very different yeah. conception of truth than yeah. I think Westerners are used but to. But I think quantum physics is kind of going in that direction too. I mean, quantum physics, they, they say that time in different places is not the same. Yeah. But is the time the time closer to the earth is actually slower than the time that is higher up the further higher up you get the um, yeah yeah it might be the other way but anyway it's one of the ways so anyway one of them time flows differently in different places yeah. So, yeah, there it is in science, too. And you have the whole thing about is light a particle or a wave? Okay, so, yeah, context. <clears throat> and the, the observer. <clears throat>